On today's show, we talk to three-time Grammy winner, six-time Country Music Association Musician of the Year, violinist, composer, and educator Mark O'Connor. We talk about how he developed his remarkable musical ability from childhood, his revolutionary Mark O'Connor string method that's all the rage among violin students in the U.S., his views on music education, and much, much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. everybody and welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan show the premier music interview show where we talk to the best musicians in the world including Grammy artists Emmy artists Tony Award winners Pulitzer Prize recipients Fulbright scholars and many many more joining me on the show is my good friend the talented Christopher Jengalewski hey Chris how's it going doing well Nick thanks for having me I am absolutely delighted to talk to my guest today, three-time Grammy winner, six-time Country Music Association Musician of the Year, violinist, composer, and educator Mark O'Connor. As a solo recording artist, he has sold over two million CDs. In 2000, O'Connor won the Grammy for Best Classical Crossover Album for Appalachian Journey with Yo-Yo Ma and Edgar Mayer. In 2009, O'Connor won a Grammy for Best Instrumental Soloist Performance Without Orchestra for Journey to the New World. The O'Connor Band took home the 2016 Grammy for Best Bluegrass Album for their debut album, Coming Home. As a session musician, he has appeared on over 500 albums, recording with numerous artists such as Dolly Parton, James Taylor, Paul Simon, Randy Travis, The Judes, and many, many more. He is the founder of the O'Connor Method, a new method for strings, which the New Yorker has called an American-grown rival to the Suzuki Method. Mark, really glad to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Well, Mark, let's get started right at the beginning. Um, let's take you back to Seattle, Washington, where you grew up. And you mentioned your parents, were they ballroom dancers? Yes, they were. Um, and they were professional dance teachers for a period of time. Unfortunately for them, it was during the uh, 19, late 1950s, and ballroom dancing was going out of fashion. Um, they were sort of like 10, 20 years, a little bit too late. Now, of course... If uh, if they had a program to the, today, it would be uh, a <laughs> monster. Be popular. <laughs> I know, but um, but it was just a tough time for uh, the economy, and uh, they struggled. Uh, and my dad um, had to quit and then went into labor and and construction. And so I um, grew up with um, parents that were um, that loved the arts at least, and wanted to make sure that uh, their kids got music and dance lessons. Were they musicians? Did they understand music or play any instruments? Well, my mother did a little bit, um, very, very little piano. And uh, But when I got started playing um, uh, myself, you know, they, uh, they really poured their attention into supporting me um, and my little sister. Um, in, in, in as many ways as they could, my mother, especially, she drove me all over the, eventually all over the country to participate in, uh, fiddling uh, competitions and guitar competitions at festivals and conventions, making sure that I had access to the finest musicians, um, at least on stage and, and in, and, and a lot of times, um, um, in social settings where I, I would end up in jam sessions with my, my musical heroes as a child. Can I ask you a question, Mark? So what age did you pick up the guitar and what age did you pick up the violin? So I was six uh, when I formally started guitar lessons and I studied classical for a while and then I adopted flamenco guitar um, when I was eight and then I had two guitar lessons going per week for a while. And that lasted until age 11 when I uh, finally found uh, uh, the violin and, and started taking lessons on that instrument. And I just started adding other things as well. I mean, by the time I was 12, I was taking lessons on about five different instruments. Do you have perfect pitch or very strong relative pitch? I have strong relative pitch. I don't I don't happen to have per perfect pitch. It's a kind of an odd thing that happens to some of some of the musicians, but 
um, to play, um, you know, a fretless instrument, an instrument where you search for the intonation. You don't have to have perfect pitch. It can be relative and relative is a little bit more of a musical trait, not as much, but uh, as a novelty. By the way, that guitar teacher who is working with you, what did you learn with that guitar teacher? Well, early on, I, I had the fortune to have the best guitar teachers in the in the city of Seattle. Uh, Calvin Christ was my classical guitar teacher, and he himself graduated from the University of Washington with a guitar degree. Um, actually, he was the first recipient of a classical guitar degree from the University of Washington in its history. And that was 1961. And then also in the 60s, there was a, a Peruvian flamenco guitarist that we discovered that uh, started teaching me at age eight. And he was fantastic, a really authentic uh, flamenco folk um, guitar playing. And from him, I started learning by ear. And so I had at the same time, I had, um, you know, sheet music in front of me and was learning by ear at the same time. And that was all before I discovered the fiddle. Now, I actually first heard uh, the violin played on television when I was eight. Uh, and I asked for a uh, violin from my parents and they could not afford a second instrument. And I kept asking for it, literally begging for it at times um, until I was finally... Um, afforded one a fifty dollar fiddle from a, a local pawn shop oh and this is when you saw with johnny cash uh with like doc watson and clarence white tony rice yeah i saw well it when i was eight i saw the johnny cash show and that was doug kershaw playing the fiddle on his first episode um that would be 1969 um but it was later that i started to see some of the bluegrass players probably age 11 um, when I first got the fiddle. So it took me three years uh, waiting for the, the, the fiddle and the violin, <laughs> however you want to call it. Um, and I had, uh, I had um, then I was just immersed into bluegrass. I saw a lot on television that year. I did see, um, you know, Clarence White and David Grisman and Richard Green and Bill Keith, um, that Neil Skinner band on PBS. I did also Vassar see Clements. Doc Watson and Vassar Clements. I, I actually uh, participated at a festival when I was 11 uh, in the Northwest. Um, it was um, uh, a f the very first bluegrass festival held in the Northwest. And um, someone that we had met put it on, and I entered the competitions there, and I got to jam with Vassar Clements there and Norman Blake and some other heroes of mine. The Buck White and the, the down-home folks were there, Tut Taylor and Butch Robbins, who was currently playing with, with Bill Monroe at that time. So how did you work on improvising? I mean, now I understand how you got into bluegrass because it seemed interesting. You went from flamenco and guitar and classical guitar, and then you saw these musicians with Johnny Cash, and that kind of just started to create this interest. And then how did you work on improvising at such a young age and, you know, using ear mostly? Well, it was, it was a gradual process. I mean, I didn't, I didn't become a, a real adept improviser um, probably until I was 13 or 14, I was still working on my variations. Uh, I would work on my own variations though. And I started, uh, writing a little bit. My first tunes were picking in the wind and Mark's waltz. And both of those appear on the album that I made, um, called picket in the wind when I was 13, the year before was my very first album, my professional release. That was when I was 12, called National Junior Fiddle Champion. And even though I wasn't improvising on that album, they were all my arrangements. Um, I would take tunes that, that Benny Thomas would teach me or Bar Barbara Lamb or John Burke. And then I would, uh, I was, you know, they encouraged me to do it as well. They saw um, a special musical talent in me right from the beginning. And they encouraged me to work on my own uh, variations, my own arrangements. Oh, yeah, Mark, talk about that. I'm, I'm so curious about your studies with Benny Thomason, who is a Texas fiddle player. And then he, he went back eventually. But he, you mentioned in an interview that he would work on themes and variations almost like a classical composer. Yeah, he was uh, 
in quite an incredible talent in my my view probably the greatest american fiddler ever um and he was responsible for you know like 50 percent of the repertoire um that was created out of his time um the you know tunes like sally johnson and gray eagle were largely his um constructions at least the long form that became known as those uh, epic fiddle tunes from America. Yeah. And say, old man, can you play the fiddle is another one. And um, so what he was doing was he was teaching me how to do, you know, virtually the same kind of thing. Um, look at a theme, uh, develop that theme and create new variations and extend the form of the, the piece um, form of the original theme and uh, so I started doing that, um, you know, probably from my first lessons from him at age 11. I started to do it pretty well by the time I was 12 because I recorded those variations on an album. Um, and that, that continued through uh, Picking in the Wind, where I was coming up with more stuff. Uh, and I started to improvise a lot more at age 13. And, you know, the, the, the biggest difference between improvisation and something like arranging or creating variations or writing, um, you know, writing music is that improvisation is a spontaneous composition, if you will, where you're trying to figure out lines and, and ideas um, that you can play on your instrument um, in real time. So you just have to be, you know, more adept at um, at uh, transferring what's happening in your imagination to your to your hands and fingers to to manipulate the instrument you're playing in that way and um, those skills develop probably uh, <laughs> over time uh, but I was definitely immersed in in, in it um, right from the beginning uh, when I started to learn how to play the violin. Were you also aware of the great violin literature and the classical tradition at that same time when you picked up the fiddle? Yes, I, my mother was a classical music uh, fan. And so uh, the, during the times that I was playing uh, uh, classical guitar uh, for the first, basically the first 10 years of my childhood, um, there was nothing but classical music being played in our household on the on the phonograph, and um, and those records included some of the great violin classics. Because she was per- particular. I mean, she loved really everything. She loved violin, uh, concerti. She loved piano, and she had she loved guitar. Obviously, or she wouldn't have started uh, me in classical guitar. She loved Segovia. So, yeah, some of her favorite violinists included Yehudi Menuhin, who I later played for and, and knew. Um, she loved, um, you know, Perlman and Heifetz and, you know, pretty much all the violin players that I, that I like and, and, and uh, admire in classical music today. What I like about the anecdote with working with Benny Thomason is that it seems like he really wanted you to develop your musicianship, your creativity, and not just get you to master a technical piece. Can you talk about your development as a composer and an arranger and all the creative elements that came into your musicianship? I think I was inspired at that during that same time, probably from age 14, I started getting into jazz um, and even... Uh, what was called fu- rock fusion or jazz fusion music at that time. I started get in, getting um, to be a big fan of Sean Luc Ponty. And, you know, you couldn't help but notice that he's writing all of his pieces. Um, so it was a little bit different than the traditional players, even in jazz, where uh, some of my favorites and who became my mentors, Stefan Grappelli and Joe Venuti, they wrote some tunes, but they mostly improvised on classics. Someone like Jean-Luc Ponty was coming up with his own, not only his own pieces of music, but his own style. Um, and that uh, piqued my attention. Uh, and then I started getting into uh, music like by the Dregs, for instance, when I was 14 and in high school. And uh, I later joined the Dregs when I was 19. So um, I started, yeah, I started, pl- I started uh, eventually um, becoming colleagues to the very 
people that I grew up listening to and admiring and being inspired by. And, um, of course, the Dregs played all their original music, uh, Steve Morris. And so that part of, part of music making really piqued my interest, and I wanted to um, do more and more of it. And I'll have to say, at some point, I sort of got um, bored, maybe, um, arranging folk music uh, like I was. I was. I was pretty good at it, but I, I think I hit a wall somewhere around age 15, and um, Rounder Records, um, luckily, allowed me to start um, uh, recording my own pieces. And that re-engaged me into the whole process of um, furthering and developing my music career at a young age. Um, at some point, since I was still a student, um, I, started to, I started to tire of what I was doing and I think getting into composing, uh, for instance, like Markology, which is the guitar album I made when I was 16, half of the music on there uh, was original music that I wrote. And that really uh, inspired me to keep going um, in that direction. When I was 17 for Rounder, they let me do On the Rampage, which was um, all 10 pieces of music on there were original and so this really, um, you know, ushered in a whole other track for me that really uh, and re-engaged me and made my playing even better because I was chasing a couple of different tracks. I was, I was coming up with new ideas musically and, and my own style at the same time. You have a lot of curiosity for all these different styles of music and you would hear something like Jean-Luc Ponty with Mahavishnu and just like, well, I want to do that, even though you're, you were coming from, well, classical into flamenco into bluegrass. And I guess uh, something I've been thinking about a lot is you could easily have become just a classical violinist, but why were you more okay with just trying pretty much everything? And obviously you're fantastic at it. I mean, I think it makes better musicians, but can you speak on that? Why people get really boxed into one style and they won't venture out of it at all? Well, in, in the era that I grew up in musically, it was really discouraged to do more than one thing. Um, and, um, you know, it was, the, it was the 70s, and I think that people were into specialization to the max, where um, it, even my mentors and friends, some of them, not all of them, I was lucky that Benny Thomason was really open to me experimenting in different uh, styles of music. And he never said no. He never held me back. He never discouraged me and, and um, only encouraged it. And that was really lucky for me because I needed a mentor like that. But I had some other mentors in my life that I wasn't seeing regularly for music lessons, but would uh, basically say, now you stick to that one thing that they liked me doing. You know, <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's what you need to be doing because that other stuff will hurt your playing or hurt this or hurt that or, you know, I always, uh, from a lot of folks, I heard no and negativity and harm and it will be harmful and these kinds of things. And I, I was, I guess, too strong of a uh, personality, even as a child, um, to succumb to it. And I listened to them. I heard the, I heard the no's and the negative, um, you know, energy coming, um, coming out. But I just sort of ignored it. Um, and now thankfully today, I think I've been a part of, um, you know, opening that up and proving, uh, to, uh, young musicians that, um, that versatility is a real strength, and especially in American music where everything has tributaries towards each other, you know, like for some reason people forgot that there's blues <laughs> in bluegrass, you know, and there's, uh, there's uh, there's uh, there's African American spirituals in uh, in jazz and on and on. I mean, like there there's a hoedown in everything. I mean, we wouldn't have rock and roll without originally having the hoedown. So um, I started to put the pieces of the puzzle together and prove that it could be done again um, and have really uh, a full range of uh, interests and musicians still excel. 
um, in, in having more than one interest. You made a really interesting statement. You said that jazz and ragtime was born on the violin, and most people wouldn't picture that because when we think of jazz, we think of big bands and we think of quartets, small combos, but it really is true. And the violin was ever present in popular music at the time. Could you speak to that, actually, how the violin had such an important role to play in the birth of a lot of contemporary styles? Absolutely. The, um, you know, I mean, and this goes back to the 1830s for ragtime, which was the original description of ragtime was called cakewalks. And it, it happened in the, uh, on the plantations in the South where the, uh, the American violin, the fiddle was uh, prevalent and, and is a music that is perfectly suited uh, for bowing um, swing rhythms, played by the bow, the up and down strokes of bowing on a, um, on the instrument, um, produce any, any number of, um, very, um, uh, intuitive syncopations and, uh, and various amounts of swing rhythm in the bow. And this lent itself to a whole new style of music that came out of, um, the cakewalks, which was, became ragtime, it was popularized though with the uh, piano and piano transcriptions and publishing, and uh, so it is it's an, another kind of interesting, mysterious um, fact about American music history that <clears throat> the violin was central to its birth uh, and bringing it into uh, in popularity, um, but then eventually was. Uh, pushed aside and ignored uh, for for other instruments, other um, environments. Um, matter of fact, you know, the speaking of band, uh, John Philip Sousa, who, who became very popular around the, the turn of the century, was originally a violinist, and he pushed the violin aside to uh, pursue band and band arrangements, uh, thinking that was going to be most popular. So people were looking for the new thing. And, and back then, uh, band and piano, and then eventually by the 1940s, guitar was going to be the most popular instrument in the world. And so um, the violin but was there the entire time, though. And so I kind of remind people of that, of the strength of that instrument, how it gave birth to American styles. I didn't know that about Sousa. That's really interesting. You have a wonderful blog where you actually talk a lot about the history of the violin and some of the great composers, a lot of them played violin. For instance, we know Mozart was a virtuoso, he played violin, Beethoven played the viola. I'm very interested in the Mark O'Connor method because you've really shown yourself to be an excellent pedagogue and you're very articulate and you clearly know the history when it comes to the violin and music in general. Can you speak a little bit about how violinists back in the day used to be what are termed player composers? They could compose, they could write, they could improvise, and that tradition was very common back in the day. Yes, it was. As a matter of fact, it was necessary um, because I don't think we would have uh, you know, half the classical music we do today without the player composer. Of course, you mentioned uh, Mozart and Beethoven. Bach was a fantastic violinist. Um, and uh, so was Mendelssohn. And uh, Dvorak was a, a, viol a professional violist. And on and on. I mean, sometimes we think of the player composers as Paganini and the virtuosos. But, um, um, you know, it's sort of like uh, in American music, I would make a parallel to say the Duke Ellingtons and Count Basies of jazz. I mean, they weren't known, necessarily known for their virtuosity, but they were player composers. They were in the band playing, they were writing the music and putting it on stage with their colleagues. And this is a, obviously has a tradition in American music, but it for sure has a tradition in early classical music. It's just really the last few generations, probably since uh, Fritz Chrysler, the famous uh, violinist that was um, really well known as a composer. Um, it was really since uh, since his incredible career, really that the violin started to be become less and less creative with the player itself. Well, why do you think that is? Why is it now that like classical musicians? 
and maybe I shouldn't make the generalization about all of them, but they don't improvise, they don't, they might not understand how to arrange or compose their own music, or really an, analyze what they're playing, understanding the changes they're playing. I mean, it is beneficial, right, that they know what they're playing and how to improvise over it and how they could reharmonize or compose as well, or write cadenzas and the like. Yeah, I think it's, I think it really is basically the training. I think the training started to move in a direction, um, probably um, World War II era. Um, the training started to move more and more into a technical direction. And then, um, you know, Suzuki came along being the most prominent uh, violin method in America and completely trained the students away from being creative and being technical instead. Um, memorization, repeat until you drop, <laughs> you know, that kind of training where I never, I never had that. I never experienced it. Nobody, you know, Benny Thomas didn't tell me to, to, to practice uh, Sally Gooden until I had every single note <laughs> uh, picture perfect. It seems very unnatural in the sense because uh, we know from history that Heifetz, when he came to America, he was very creative. He was really taking part of the American music scene. He was writing pop songs. He was, and many of these old European virtuosos, they were full musicians and they really dove into the, the music scene of America when they came over. Yes, I mean, and, the, and people like Yasha Heifetz had theory in their background uh, since probably the advent of the modern music conservatory. Um, I'll say since, since, uh, since World War II era, um, theory was introduced to most violin uh, students um, um, at college, you know, uh, over the last couple of generations when they probably should have had theory when they were kids um, so they could use it in, their, in uh, their own musical development. And for instance, I mean, I knew what chords were when I was a little kid. And so when I started playing violin, I was immediately relating my notes, my sequence of notes, my, my themes that I was learning on the violin to a chord, to harmony, to counterpoint, to rhythm. I mean, if you don't access music through these, um, th these different bridges to, to connect the dots, really, as a full musician, then you become, you become sort of like a memorex, that you're just... Um, you know, you just, someone pre presses play and then your sequence of notes comes out. And, um, while that's technically, um, you know, adroit and, and perhaps entertaining on some level for me, I, I wanted much more out of music. I just didn't want to be a technician. Um, even though I'm known for my technical ability. And I think that, that I sort of prove that through creative inspiration, you become better as a player, you know, if, if you're going to be that kind of, uh, if you're going to be on that level, um, it all works together. You know, we had a great guest a month or two ago, the great classical improviser, Dr. John Mortensen, and he mentioned, you were talking about theory there, Mark, and he mentioned that in the 18th century, everybody knew figured bass, which is in a way knowing chords, and it was just, everybody knew it. It was just standard if you were a musician. And now nobody really knows. Like you were saying, like theory only starts in college. Yeah, I mean, there, it's required when you get into music school and then you take six months of music theory. And I was thinking, gosh, that's like so late in, uh, in the development of these musicians, especially so since violin in particular, we start students out so young. Like it'd be, I think it'd be different uh, for, for whatever, you know, for just for this theory to put forward. It's like, say, if, I, if all violin students started at age 12, then if you got a bunch of theory at age 17, well, you know, that's five years into it. It might not, um, might, might not be too late to apply that theory to your, your actual playing. But if you're going to start at age four and five, that's a lot of years to go as a, uh, a performer, as a player, as, uh, and without connecting what you're doing to, um, to theory, to harmony, to, um, to, uh, to, to composition, to arranging, to improvisation. 
abilities because if, I mean, if, you know, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And when, since we start off the, the kids so young, I mean, they have been playing a long time by the, that by the time they get into college or music conservatory. So how is your approach different? Like, do you want to talk a bit about the O'Connor method and like what reforms you're bringing? And actually, if you could also, if we go back just a bit, you were talking about repetitions and like, to what degree would you say, like, you know, you want, you do want to practice patterns, scales, arpeggios, uh, rhythms. How much of that do you, like, if you broke up your practice and if you, if you could also get into a bit of how your program works as well, like, how would you suggest a violinist or any musician practicing and breaking up their practice? Well, I would definitely mix it up some. I mean, there's no reason why musicians, whether they're amateur, professional, or students, um, need to memorize every single thing they learn. That's one thing. It's like, mix it up a little bit. It's like, I mean, what are you going to perform on stage? Obviously, if you're going to get on stage, you'll want to make that piece um, as perfect as you can. So that, that part of your year is dedicated, okay, what pieces I'm going to perform in my recital or at the end of my um, school year's recital or whatever that is. Um, I get that. You know, you want to you want to prepare, but everything you learn doesn't have to go through the same you know meat grinder. I mean, I like to mix it up, saying, "Well, this tune, let's let's tune this, uh, let's learn uh, learn this by ear," um, or on this tune, um, it's this going to be more about uh, creativity. We're going to learn how to improvise on this piece of music, um, and this song maybe it's like, "Well, guess what?" On this song you're not going to learn the melody. You're going to learn everything else about it, including how to accompany it. Uh, maybe on a second instrument, you know, and this, all this, this idea really, um, gave way to the O'Connor method and, and how I think it's absolutely necessary that we get back to, you know, music basics for string students where they are a part, not only a part of the orchestra, but a part of any ensemble, a part of a band, a part of um, jazz again, a, some, a functioning member of the musical community that can contribute on any different amount of levels uh, necessary. I mean, I got so tired of you know running into situations where I'm hearing that the violinist can't um, fit in with an ensemble unless they had a, a, a a page of sheet music in front of them to read from, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I mean, that's nice when it happens, but it's not going to happen every time. So what do you do then? You just say, no, I can't, you know, or no, you know, and you don't take the advantage uh, of this wonderful opportunity to share your music with um, new, a new set of friends or uh, a community. And so we're, we're missing out basically. It's like, if you keep lessening the opportunities for children to be involved and engaged in music, and then then we're not winning in 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 violin anymore. We're not we're uh, taking ourselves out of the picture, out of the game. You mentioned that Suzuki is the predominant method of string training for children in the United States. How is the O'Connor method different from the Suzuki method? So parents listening they can make sense of what's happening and because they, they might hear that Suzuki is popular. What different things does the O'Connor method bring to the table? Well, one of the things, and it's a big one is that, um, we use American music, um, for the beginning, um, books, especially, and the, the really strong folk songs and styles that the American scene has produced over the last several hundred years. Um, some of the staples include um, the African American spiritual, the blues, the hoedown, a ragtime, folk songs, and and the like. Another a big aspect about it is that it really does um, concentrate on cultural diversity. Um, for any kind of educational program that doesn't involve um, culture beyond, you know, dead white people from Europe. Um, I think is is a mistake, uh, especially in America. Um, but I, I think all over the world, people are relating to the idea that we should be celebrating the world's culture that informs our life today. And violin um, should reflect that. It all it all it always has in the past. I mean, violin goes back hundreds of years in Mexico. 
it goes back hundreds of years in South America. There's no reason why um, we should we should be denied all these you know amazing styles, especially from Africa, um, the Middle East, and um, and important um, cultures of the world that have bring uh, brought forth string playing um, and string um, culture. And so the, the diversity of culture that informs American music is really important. The creativity and improvisation, um, you know, putting music in a method book that allows the child to think outside the box. So it's not always about the specific notes <clears throat> on the page all the time, although I think they're important and they should be addressed. Uh, and we want our students to address those notes as well. But we don't want the music lesson to end there. We want the ch children to add something of their own to it. And I think um, the fourth component of personal expression is, is, is um, I know, utmost, uh, I think, uh, a, a trait in American music life that's really important. I mean, you hear all the great, say, electric guitar players in, say, rock music. And every single one of them has their own style. They're playing, often they're playing sort of the same guitar through the same amplifiers, but they have their own expression. And I think that's so beautiful. And we, we had that at one time in classical violin and we lost it because of this kind of homogenized training. Uh, but the fiddlers uh, in American folk music have always retained that. Arguably up until this, also this last two generations, when Suzuki became so uh, prominent, even in fiddle music circles. <clears throat> um, it just, I don't know what happened, but we started to lose our um, um, American music identity, even with the fiddlers. So um, I think the, the O'Connor method is about uh, being more creative, uh, having a creative lesson plan, but without uh, forgetting about the string orchestra and preparing those same students for orchestra if they wish to follow that track, because I think that's important that there's a methodology that's inclusive and doesn't leave things out, important things out like the orchestra. Can I play devil's advocate? Will the O'Connor method adversely affect playing the classical repertoire? How do you teach technique in the O'Connor method? Well, I think the very first few books um, are important for any method. And the way I see it is that we got to get the kids hooked into music. And so say if you're five or six and you really, you know, you, you become to love the violin through the O'Connor method. And let's just say by the time you're 10 or 11 or 12 uh, and you're now you're a good music student and you you're serious about it. You want to continue. That is the point where I think that that children can start to specialize. And if they want to learn more about Mozart and Beethoven, then they can start learning those techniques uh, for that specific music. At the same time, if you're 11 or 12 and you want to learn more about bluegrass, you can specialize in that. So I think that any good method provides a jumping off point for specialization. I think that we have a great framework for, for children to be able to use it as a platform for whatever they want to do in music. And it doesn't hold them back. As a matter of fact, it gives them more opportunities to make their own choices. Your method has created a lot of interest in the string community. And even many professional classical violinists have responded very positively to the method. Could you talk about how people have responded overall to the introduction of this method? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's seen its ups and downs a little bit because it was so new and so revolutionary. And I, you know, I, I get that because, I mean, anything new in a real traditional environment, um, it could be scary to, especially the traditionalists. I mean, I mean, this is a very progressive, um, um, idea. And, um, and now that it's been out for eight years, now that we've seen it for eight years, it simply works. You know, when I first released it, I was hoping it would work. I knew that, um, that it worked on, the, the laboratory tests, if you will, at my string camps, um, you know, pieces of it at a time. Um, but, uh, to put it all together, to see that, how it's grown now, tens of thousands of children are learning how to play the violin and viola 
and uh, related string instruments using this method um, has been just an incredible situation to see. And um, our string camp, actually, that we just concluded two weeks ago was the largest O'Connor method string camp we've ever put on. So, and now uh, we had um, 131 students come from all over the, the place. And these are like growing exponentially. Um, so I uh, feel like, um, you know, it's definitely something that, um, you know, my teacher training sessions, I, I get reports right from the teachers where many of my teacher trainers are classical musicians, but they're, they're definitely looking for something else to inspire the young kids. Um, you know, but by the time you're 13 or 14 and 15 years old, um, you're making the students making a lot of the decisions, you know, they're talking to their parents or talking to their teachers. Like I want to, I want to follow in this direction. And uh, most likely the parents will support uh, those, those conversations. The, the conversation is not being held with a six year old. It's either yes or no. Do you like violin? <laughs> yes or no. And, and there, there is no, there's no conversation about, you know, I'd like to find a different style of music, you know, and uh, the six or seven or eight year old is not going to have that conversation. So we have to get a methodology out there um, that covers the range of children's and their uh, uh, children's interest in music. And when you, when you narrow it down to such a, 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 a small focus um, as basically as Suzuki did, um, is going to ultimately leave out a bunch of kids. Matter of fact, when I, when I uh, authored the method before I released it, I found out just horrific statistics uh, from Suzuki and other, other methods like that, where there was a 90% attrition rate uh, within three or four years of the violin student. So, you know, uh, so as many, like say 10 students walk through the door at age four or five or six, and in three years, they're ninety uh, percent. Nine out of ten are gone. They've either left the violin, or and many of them have left music uh, altogether, which is just a, a horrible uh, statistic. And I thought, well, we could, we definitely can improve that, you know. So, what would your advice be to like Nikhil and I, for example, are both educators, and you have a student that has been Suzuki trained or they're more of a classical musician and I, you know, I wouldn't want to take them away from that, but you just want them to improve and to understand music more deeply. How would you go about taking a Suzuki trained teacher or student and, and try to get them to embrace more styles and some of the things that you're offering in your program? Well, I think that, you know, these things are, are possible. And, um, I, I more or less call them cultural intervention. Um, because it's, it's not, it's, it's not just, um, it's not just, you know, changing the, the, the book It's really changing a whole life, uh, an understanding of how music works. Um, and it's such a shame because, you know, I any of our students can play an orchestra. I mean, I can play an orchestra. My wife can play an orchestra. My, my, any people, you know, any person in my Mark O'Connor band can play an orchestra. I mean, that, that is not a huge leap for us that have been sort of fully musically trained. You know, we might not be a concert master, you know, that would take, you know, uh, in a considerable amount of training and effort and excellence to reach that position. But to, you know, to be, but to be in the string section of an orchestra, this shouldn't be that big a stretch where as, uh, on the, conversely, some of these same musicians, they look at a bluegrass band or a jazz band and go, I could never do that. And what a shame because a lot of fiddlers can, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like is, some of this is not rocket science, you know, like it does, you don't have to be a virtuoso necessarily to participate in any of this, you know, like it should be community music, just like a community orchestra, community bluegrass, community fiddling, community swing playing, you know, um, I think most music students would wish for something like this in their life. So how has the success been with the, with the, the method? I, I've noticed that thousands upon thousands of kids are, are getting on to the method and joining. It's been tremendous. And we, I've, I've created a program where people can come over to it at various levels of ability. 
Um, obviously, I really promote the idea of, uh, of a young violinist student starting with the O'Connor Method so they get a good foundation musically as they build their technique in order to play well. Um, and, you know, at, at that beginning, they're immersed in cultural diversity and creativity in American music and all the beautiful styles and keys and eras that, um, that can inspire them. Uh, for more advanced uh, violin students, they can come over to uh, my book, Four and Five. Uh, there's so many duos, you know, just the idea of playing a duo with one other person uh, um, uh, allows them to basically kind of be in a band. Um, because all the music is written down and I spent a lifetime figuring out how to write American violin playing down in literature. And uh, over the course of my work with Yo-Yo Ma and not just Lauren Sonnenberg and, you know, the Curtis professor, like, you know, Ida Kavafian and, and, and on and on, I perfected how to do that. And, and it works. You can, you can sound, uh, good playing, uh, these arrangements, um, as a advanced classical violinist, because I made it possible for them to access the music through literature, through the sheet music page. Um, you know, I think that, um, when I play, uh, like, like my stuff with Yo-Yo Ma, um, some of that, a lot of that was written down. Um, it wasn't improvised and I think it really inspired people to think that they could uh, sound free. I remember Maxim Vengeroff when he first heard me play, we both played at a gala and he was, he was commenting on how free the music is. And I realized that it's, it's, it's not as much about the literature uh, itself as it is about um, the style. The why, why were American styles? I mean, when you think of it, think of any American, uh, think of any classical violin student. If they want to play something American, it's usually Gershwin. And it's usually Heifetz's transcriptions of a few Gershwin pieces, right? And there's not like almost nothing else. And I went, wow, there's so much stuff to write down for, for all of our players, you know? Um, I think it's just, you know, people, you know, like me saw this problem and wanted to, to try to get in there and help um, and spread the good word. So uh, we've got all kinds of people. I mean, these duos, for instance, are beautiful recitals uh, for, for recitals uh, for, for conservatory students or the profession. I mean, you know, this is all professional music too. It's not just, it's, not, it's actually not student music. Even, even the music in the first books are not necessarily only for students. I mean, it's professional music. Boil them Cabbage Down is our first song. And I jam on that. I jammed on that with Wynton Marsalis in France at that jazz festival. That's a YouTube, you know, and all those little, all these little kids that are learning that song can see that and go, wow, that's my little tune. That's a, my, my tune that I begin playing with, you know? And so there's a big message there. It's inclusivity. Um, is cultural diversity, is creativity. At the very same time, you're working on your technique and learning how to play better. To end off, I'd just like to ask you some quick, fun questions, just rapid fire, and uh, we'll just have a little fun with these. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, top three violinists that are not you. Go. <laughs> Classical ones and contemporary ones. <laughs> well, Yasha Heifetz is my, my favorite. Um, I would have to say... Um, it's Doc Perlman, and uh, oh my goodness, uh, I think Yehudi Menuhin when he was sixteen, and then, uh, <laughs> um, and then uh, for for fiddle, I would say uh, uh, Benny Thomason um, at the top, and uh, and Vassar Clements, and. Uh, either uh, Kenny Baker or Johnny Gimble. What about uh, top three composers? Ooh, well, um, I love Beethoven first, and uh, I love what uh, Antonin Dvorak did here when he came to America and gave us the memo that American composers should use our own 
materials to inform our compositions, which we really still haven't got the memo yet, but I, I've taken it to heart. And uh, so I like, I, so Dvorak is, is to me an American music hero. Um, so I'm going to include him up there. And uh, uh, Bach. I use Bach in my book four and five. I think he's, you know, is the, the, the greatest violin literature. Now, what about your top three modern composers or songwriters? It could be like any style, contemporary. Oh my goodness! <laughs> um, well, you know we are we are out on the road right now, um, opening for Zach Brown Band, and uh, I'll have to say that uh, Zach Brown's uh, songs and his ability at songwriting and band leading and all that is is blowing blowing me away, blowing us away. It's a burning group, huh? <laughs> uh, in yeah, in the contemporary scene, I really, uh, really am, is, um, admire what he's doing. And he actually helped produce two, our two new songs. And I saw him in the studio work with us. And uh, he's really a, a genius uh, at uh, at this. So, and about you know vocal arranging and and just tremendous. Um, and uh, my goodness, I. Uh, I probably have a lot of colleagues, you know, since it's modern <laughs> and, you know, it involves a lot of my friends. It will be, it'll be hard to narrow it down other than, uh, you know, kind of like pointing out some things I've been working on with people. Um, but, uh, but, you know, some of the things I, I grew up listening to when I was a child still strikes me as, you know, the most important um, and I think that's why, that's why music education is so important because, because it, those are the things that, you know, are life altering. It's like when, when you're inspired, when you're a kid, you'll never forget it. I was going to say that you are a pretty ridiculous guitarist. So who are, <laughs> who are your top three guitarists? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I would probably have to say, um, Django Reinhardt. Tony Rice and Doc Watson. Um, but Norman Blake is when, when I was a kid, Norman Blake was it for me. Um, growing up, I just loved his sort of more modern early night, late sixties, early seventies uh, approach. And you used to hang out with Chet Atkins a lot, right? Was, was he an influence on you? You know, Chet was a huge, he became a mentor figure for me. Um, when I was 19, in Nashville, when I moved to Nashville, I listened to a little bit of him growing up, um, but not as much. And, uh, and he, but he became a, a real fan of mine and really supported me and we hung out together. Um, so I think in more of a professional level, he influenced me a lot. Um, not, not as much early on on my own guitar playing. Did you ever get to play with or like meet Lenny Bro since they were so close to? I know he was close with Chet, and he was an interesting character. And he, he, you know, he died pretty young. And I was wondering if you, since you were in that circle, if you had ever played with him or met him. No, I, I, I heard, um, of course, all kinds of stories from Chet about Lenny. Um, he was really uh, affected by him, and uh, I just missed him. Um, I'd also include Clarence White too. He was a major influence um, as well. Proudest musical moment in your massive career? Well, give me a proud moment. Wow, I'm pretty proud of the the band, um, the Mark O'Connor band. In that, I can't believe that you know the, these family members are are coming together to produce this kind of result. Um, that's that's pretty pretty upscale. Um, you know, there's not really, um, there's not really much of a novelty about it. You know, it's, it's just really fine musicians coming together to play. Um, so I was really proud, I think, of putting that together. The the O'Connor method, um, because to see its impact on um, so many children um, and positively and, and, uh, and uh, them being inspired by music. I mean, it's amazing. The kids, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll choose one or two or three songs that will inspire them. And we got them in this, these books. We've, you know, they'll either be totally inspired by 
Bone Cabbage Down or Boogie Woogie or, or Beautiful Skies or When the Saints Go Marching In or Amazing Grace or any of these like epic foundational pieces and to see the light bulbs go off in these kids, man, it's just, I mean, it did for me. I, I totally get it. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise. It's not a surprise to me, really. And it shouldn't be a surprise to a lot of people. I mean, when you take foundationally epic, strong classics that have been in our culture for hundreds of years um, that never went away, that, that, uh, that are not, you know, had not been taught in classrooms lately, um, and still the light bulb goes off. I mean, they're that strong of pieces for beginners. So that's a big deal. Um, I think probably, uh, for my own work, my, my, uh, my Americana symphony that I composed, uh, for symphony orchestra when, uh, that was performed this year by the Charlotte symphony. And every time I hear it, um, and I'm in the audience, um, I feel, um, uh, I think I, it's, it's a, it's music for others. It's not about me. It's not about my playing ability. Um, I'm able to step back from my own, um, musical work and, and let it go. And I think that's a real proud moment for me too. And the very last question, Mark would be, what's the best advice you could give to a young musician today? Well, I would say, you know, don't limit your opportunities um, by choosing something over another just out of hand. Um, you know, just keep keep your mind open because you don't. Almost no musician knows exactly what they're going to be doing um, all through you know, being in their student life. And um, you know, my own my own uh, kid in my band is perfect example. Forrest O'Connor. I mean, I, he went to Harvard, uh, and he was a really good academic. He graduated top 2% Harvard. He was going to go to, into Harvard business school. And then at some point he just starts liking to write songs and sing, which blew me away because he never did that at all. As a teenager, he started to get into mandolin at age 14 or 15, but you know, it's kind of like, you know, something like of a hobby. Were you a tough dad because you were you're such a great musician? Did you want your kids to be great musicians as well? No, no, I never, I never made um, the kids practice. Um, I encouraged, I wanted them to have music lessons. That was my only, that was where, where I put my foot down. I said, you got to have a music, a regular music lesson on anything you want, any instrument, but I just want you to be taking music. Um, and uh, it was pretty simple for me. It's like it, it for me, it gave that, that my child another mentor in their life, uh, some some kind of leader to look up to each week. Um, and I thought that was important for their uh, childhood. But other than that, I mean, I knew I, I mean, I'm a professional musician and I think it would be pretty self selfish for me to try to design uh, my kids to follow in my my footsteps. Um, I'm just not. You know, I'm not like that. I, I, I understand that's part of our past and history, but in our, in my generation where kids have access to go to college, um, and study what they want to, and then, and develop their own career. I mean, I'm not going to hold them back and, and force them to do what I'm doing. So it's really, a, it's, I'm obviously very gratified that they, you know, full circle, he, he comes back and wants to play the music that I grew up playing. Uh, with me <laughs> so, <laughs> and then writing his own stuff right singing and writing i mean yeah is 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 i'm kind of blown away by it well everybody the great mark o'connor three-time grammy winner six-time country music association musician of the year amazing composer educator wish you all the best mark with on your tour with the mark o'connor band i hope you pick up more grammys and and turn more heads and thank you so much for coming on the broadcast from both of us. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed this hour with you, too. And thanks for listening out there. And I'll tell you, too, Mark, uh, I just started teaching here in Singapore. I'm from the United States, and I'm, I'm a drummer. And Nick convinced me to come out here. And I already 
really love everything you're saying, and and I think that uh, we want to. Well, we would like to bring you over here at some point, <laughs> but um, I'll have to read yeah. through. It. I'll have to read through it more. But it just seems like it's really hitting the nail on the head. And I've been hearing a lot about this more blended approach to practicing music, and want to get these kids into these folk songs, and and I'll be teaching very young kids too, and I'm hoping that. Uh, this will really resonate with them and make them love music. So I'll definitely have to pick up a copy of your books to get those tunes as well for myself. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to, you got to check it out. It was, it, you'll see these unbelievable results in the first year and it is quite inspiring. They'll just, they're learning, you know, two, three times as fast. Um, and then they, they probably won't quit. I mean, at <laughs> least on those, at those numbers. <laughs> Like, I mean, there's going to be some attrition because, I mean, that's just the way life is. But, I mean, 90, 9 out of 10, I mean, oh, my God, you know, by year three and four. So we, we can improve that a lot, you know. And then the more kids we get playing, the the, the better the world will be, uh, you know. Like, we've got to get some more positive vibes going. Yeah, uh, well, you know what? It sounds great bringing the Mark O'Connor method to Singapore. That sounds like a great idea. And also, um, we didn't get to mention it, but you can back reference it. I, um, Maggie and I were guest soloists with this, the Singapore Chinese um, symphony. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. And that was, uh, in matter of fact, that was only about three or, three or four, four years ago. And they they um, adapted some of my arrangements to uh, the traditional instruments and it was fantastic. And they, they filmed it and we've been waiting for the DVD for, for all this time. Like, like they keep saying they're going to release it or they're going to send it to me because we want to put it on YouTube because uh, people should see this. It is incredible. Like, so you, you got my, you know, my Americana stuff like strings and thread suite. And then you got an orchestra full of, of traditional Chinese orchestral instruments playing it and playing it spot on. I mean, it, the Arhus and everything is a, is pretty amazing to see and to hear. So if you know anybody over there, encourage them to like, you know, get it out online but it should be on YouTube so people can enjoy it. We need more music. Exactly. We got to get music online, more music online, and especially cross cultural performances like this, where you know you've got American music played by Chinese instruments, and and to turn out so beautifully. This is not a it's not a novel thing. It's really gorgeous. I mean, it's everybody did a great job, and we really enjoyed it. So there's something to look at, and that's right in your backyard there. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us on on the show. All the best for your touring, and we really hope you'll come back to the show. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening to our interview with the amazing Mark O'Connor. What a privilege to talk to him, and I hope you enjoyed listening to us ask this great artist questions about music. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. We really hope to get more amazing guests in the future. Thanks again, and we'll see you at the next show.